start off the show today by offering condolences to the family and friends of Brendan Ogie Duffy. Absolutely horrific news um, coming through after Friday night. You know, uh, an accident coming home after a brilliant comeback win for the for the man in her 20s. He was minor captain. He was under 21 captain. And I saw the interview with Banty McEnany after the match. And like, I mean, I was just, you know, struck by that. Let the players pick the captain of my minor team in 2018. It was a 30 man panel. 24 of them voted for Ogie Duffy as captain. I don't know why Cormac McAnallen just jumped into my head. You know, these kind of young lads that are coming through, they're just captain material, um, Aaron. And again, another picture, they all spoke really well after it. Aaron Mulligan, you know, he he was crying after the game. You know, they obviously were close and he yeah. played underage with him. There's just a lot of feeling involved in that game. We'll get on to the classic it was. You were there. Um, you made your Sky debut. Congratulations. But like, I mean, I'm sure it was a very charged atmosphere there. It was. There was mixed feelings initially, to you know, whether the game should be going ahead or not. Um, but I think both teams, uh, as best as they could, parked um, the emotion and obviously served up a classic. But yeah, just in terms of what happened, I think just us all as GA supporters, it, it left, you know, that sick feeling in the pit of our stomach um, that you've lost a family and, and teammates have lost someone so close to them. So, um, yeah, can, so just sincere condolences to them um, and it'll be it'll be a tough few days and um, obviously the Ulster Council is going to have a big decision to make on, on what's going to happen in relation to that under-20 final now this weekend. Yeah, no, they definitely are. We'll get we'll get on and talk about the match a little bit, uh, Colin, because this was the most bonkers match. Some people are saying this is the greatest Ulster Championship match that they can remember, and look, you know, you'd be make you'd be hard pressed to try and look back through all the Ulster matches I've watched and say, when it comes to the skill, the comeback, the goals, the excitement, and then obviously you, you have that tragedy on Friday night, maybe pushing Monaghan over the lead. You have Conor McManus maybe winning himself, buying himself a, a couple of one very handy free. It just had everything, Colin. Yeah, it did. Well, and, uh, I don't know what you mean about Ulster football. It's been <laughs> the best province for the last number of years. Like, so uh, I'm not sure where. No, but some of, some uh, people negative... some people were comparing it back to you know that famous Derry Down game back in '94, for example. Yeah, look, it, it, it had everything, and you know, I, I'm sort of watching it go on. What I couldn't understand. Uh, what like both teams clearly set out to go at it. Um, you know, the the, the direct, there was a lot of direct football. Um, you know, the, it, it had everything. It had skill. It had passion. You know, we, there was fans back in the back in the uh, stadium. Everything. It just had absolutely. It, it really did sort of take us back to you know the early days where things were were a bit like that. Teams were so open. Scores. It was just end to end. Score to score. Now, in saying that, I was watching that saying probably that's not going to happen. This is this is never going to see. It. We're never going to see this again. In the rest of the championship. But by God, I really enjoyed it. I just thought this was an absolute cracking game of football to watch. Yeah, kind of reminds you of the Monaghan Donegal league game where we all said that won't happen in the championship. They're all going to quieten down. You know, the <laughs> defense will get on top, but it didn't. Aaron, now look, I mean, we, we're going to criticize the Armagh defending. There's no doubt about that because it was absolute. You know crazy stuff at times to leave McCarran and McManus in there with nobody really covering them it's kind of a head scratcher but like I mean we'll go through the four Monaghan goals because like Armagh will be kicking themselves um, the first one was a long kick pass and like Colm says feature of it was just kick pass and get it in there before maybe the covering sweepers um, could get back long pick, kick pass to um, McCarran um, Jared Oak didn't track McInesby let McInesby off and he got the 1-2 into McManus brilliant finish now Jack, that's Jack McCarran's first involvement um, in a goal you know found himself uh, free second one then was from a bad kick out like you can you can cover this I didn't spot this at the time like this kick out he'd been doing well on the long ones and he decided you, you can take it up from there yeah, well, Shea McGill, um, that was his first game. Um, he, he was the county under-20 goalkeeper, but his, his first year really would have been at club level was last year, and obviously it was a much shorter season. So he, he's this, the young has played maybe 10 games for his club uh, between league championship hadn't played any at county level but um, he's well renowned for a booming long kick out um, but that one in particular he went to go short but he went to go short with his bad foot um, <laughs> to put it out to the sideline where I just thought we just had conceded a goal you know we were just a wee bit rattled at that stage again I would have been if, if you're going to go short go with your good foot just make sure like so it was the best advice I was ever given was by my father who always said do the simple things well do you know, and in terms of being a goalkeeper, your first day, high pressure stakes, just swing the body around, get it. Because he was looking to put it right to the sideline. Yeah. Now, I know he would have had to turn his whole body around to get it out Make there. Make it obvious, yeah. But 
there was nobody on the Armagh player on the sideline, you know, it would have took someone a while to get across to him. Um, so it was, it was, it was a bad mistake from him. But in fairness to him, he, he did regroup, but it just, it absolutely put Armagh on the back foot at that stage. You could see they were, they were rattled for quite a while after. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a harsh learning lesson for him. Um, there, there's no doubt of that. Go on with the left foot. It was actually the invisible man on the sideline column because when we saw it, like he couldn't see the person he was actually giving it. It's like, what's after happening? I didn't spot it. I didn't spot the I bad foot. No, I didn't spot it either. But uh, I've always been crying out about goalkeepers using both feet um, and trying to do it. So um, yeah, look, it, it obviously set. It was a massive swing in, at, at that point in time in the game, and really just uh, it left our head or left our man really. On the back foot for that. Um, I, I, the, the one that really gets me is the is the Q's goal. Um, being a defender because it was, it was I was a darn a friend of mine, so I can't give him too much credit for the the work he did did to get it. But he played a simple one two pass. Yeah. Followed a run. Nobody tracked him. And he put it in the net. And that's you're talking about Armad defending there, not tracking the runners. Nobody stepped across to even try and take him. It was. I was watching that. If that happened in a club game at home, you would be you'd be fairly annoyed at, at nobody tracking the runner. Um, it happened last week actually as well with um, for Brian Kennedy's goal with Tyrone. But yeah, look, so, th- th- these are goals and games. You know, people talk about goals winning games, and you know, with a couple of goals that are might conceded here from the kickout from Cuse's late run. You know, it was. It was just madness. It was, I couldn't actually believe what I was watching. Yeah, well, that, like that, that's the obvious one. And that did remind you of kind of, you know, of like a club game where the intensity is low. And I think it was Grimley um, didn't really follow him. But Mackay, I would have at fault for the next two goals because, number one, McCarron's not that fast. He's not marking young Jamie Brennan or someone like that who's fecking buzzing all over the place. McCarron, you should have been able to get hands on McCarron. Like he threw a dummy. Now, that's too easy. If you're touch tight, he's not selling that on you because you're, you're close to him. It was very lackadaisical. He wasn't uptight. He got sold with a dummy. McCarron went in, did brilliantly, right? Drew the man, I think it was Mackin, and gave it across. But then, even for the Hughes goal, Mackay is on the other side of McCarron when McCarron's all left. Now, I know he scored a point with the right, but like he, he, he should have read that hand pass. Could anyone could see a mile away Darren Hughes is coming bombing down the middle. McCarron was going to give that back to him. Take a step across. I, I would have had Mackay at fault there a little bit, Aaron. Yeah, well, in terms of... I know, uh, particularly, say, the likes of James Morgan, who was inside on McManus, uh, and then you had Aaron who was um, on McCarron. Like, James doesn't mind being left one-on-one as long as there's pressure on the ball coming in, you know, and, and that's the most frustrating thing from an Armour perspective. Um, you know, obviously, well, not tracking the runners will really bug Gazer or Kier McKeever and those boys, um, but not having pressure on that pass coming in. But that's the thing about your full backs, like they have to be touch tight. They have to be a clag. You have to be making contact all the time. That even if Jack McCarron's winning the ball, he's under pressure to offload it again. Yeah. Um, or like you say, you could see from quite a bit out that Hughes was going to continue his run. Like, worst case scenario for me there, you're trying to you're trying to figure out straight away what's the most dangerous thing here. So if Jack McCarron gets that ball, McKay leaves him be and steps across on Darren Hughes, he stops a goal and Jack McCarron kicks a point. Yeah. Do you know where he didn't really do either? He got caught in no man's land. You say he got caught on Jack's Call left, on the hand, other left side. hand side yeah. where he should have stayed on the goal side um, that he could have blocked the run coming through the middle. So again... Fundamental errors that just cost the air. Like, um, you know, we'll go on to what they did in terms of their comeback, but to concede four goals and concede four and a half, it just leaves you with an absolute mountain to claim um, and throw in conditions and all that there. Uh, in terms of what energy it was going to take out of them, it, it was a disastrous first half from a defensive perspective. Yeah, and you, you, then you start giving our man credible credit because they didn't drop their heads. They're, what a body blow. Four, I think I, I saw someone drop their heads when the fourth goal went in. <laughs> like, I think it was Jared Oak Burns. Just a natural reaction going, yeah. oh, Jesus. And then they scored 14 points. So they stayed in touch a little bit. And then amazingly, they were able to get back into the game. Like, Turbot was brilliant when he came on and showed incredible courage, Colm, to get on to that Reen O'Neill bullet, which we know that, you know, he can stick in there. there was, you know, he knew he was going to get opened by Rory Began, who must be 16 stone, like, I mean, and he still just stuck himself in there. Yeah, look, you have to give Armagh, like, massive credit. Uh, they really, as you say, they stuck with, they stuck with Monaghan. Um, the subs obviously had a massive impact, Turbot especially. Um, I think he kicked one, 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 two, whatever he kicked. And that goal, like, he had no right to go for that ball. I, I've seen a lot, a lot of men pull out, pull out of balls and like he just went for that. And Began, to be fair, 
I'd be there'd be question marks over him of how he didn't get there, but and he actually needed to get caught out a few times with balls bouncing over his head and yeah, uh, and that. But look, you know, you have to give massive credit. Um, once that game started to switch, Armagh were on top. I couldn't see. I don't know how Monaghan. Well, we'll get on to how Monaghan came back to to, to, to do what they did and to, to close the game out. But uh, Armagh, you have to give them a uh, huge credit to the players. They stuck to their task. It's, it would have been so easy for them just to stop and just to go. You know what? We'll just, you know, we'll walk out here because they, they were they looked dead and buried um, at, at one point. And uh, you know, obviously, we'll chat about Rain and Rain O'Neill, um, Austin O'Neill, and these guys. They really stepped up. They, you know, the heads didn't drop. They stuck to their task, and you know, some wonderful scores and wonderful pass, passages to play to get them back in there. So, like, I mean, what did they do, Aaron, in the second half? Did what, did Monaghan get a little bit over leading and not? commit as many bodies forward or did Armagh start covering off that D which was wide open like Armagh dropping players back along a line into 45 and still allowing that kick pass inside to McCarran and McManus seems like tactically a very silly thing to do why is the centre back at least not you don't have to play a sweeper use your centre back there's enough lads around there to pick up the men did did they, did they fix that tactically because going forward wasn't a problem for them I think it was, there was a, a few key things from a Monaghan perspective uh, I think it was in terms of heat and energy levels that they expanded in the first half. They didn't commit as many people to attack. You could see clearly um, off play that they had more people that, that were sitting back. I would probably put it down to an energy thing because I think after what happened them last year against Cavan and how they sat back and tried to see out a game, I would be stunned if Banty then went to them at the weekend and said, you know what, we have a seven point lead. Let's just see this game out. Let's yeah. pick off a few scores. So Sometimes players just do that, don't they? they? It's, a, it's just I won't make that run now because yeah. we're seven up. It's exactly in, in your own head. You'll say if we would have engine case, I need it again. The problem then is once it turns, it's very hard to flick the switch and go again. From an RMR perspective, they put far more pressure in the middle third of the field. They weren't, where it got to the stage where they were dropping everyone back nearly to their own 45 um, and then not putting on enough contact or enough uh, enough physical presence then. They were tackling further out the field. What was happening in the first half was Monaghan were coming nearly unopposed to the Armagh 45. So by the time they got to the 45, they were fresh. Yeah. There, there was no, like no one had been checking the runs. No one had been stopping them. There's you know, nothing worse if you're coming up as a halfback, I know, and someone's constantly got their hand on, like, I'm stopping, starting, stopping, starting. After two or three times, you just turn and walk back again. So by the time they came inside the Armagh 45, they were flying. They were yeah. running everywhere. The Armagh right on the sidelines, and they were all coming in off the wings at pace. Um, so the physical contact in the middle of the field stopped that. The, the Munhan boys going for a run, stopping. The same pressure wasn't on them then, but if you think back to the the second goal in particular, like like that's perf- that was perfection of what I know Geezer Kier McKeever would have been uh, asking for. I can't remember who the Armagh player was, but he got pressure on Stephen O'Hanlon, showed him towards the sideline, but straight away Rory Grugan he sends his up. blood. I think it's McQuillan. Dub- it was- doubles up on him. And next thing, he's on the sideline, under pressure, trying to solo, no support around him, get a turnover. But at that stage then, Grugs doesn't stand and wait, looking round to see, can I tap it back? Head up, bang, straight towards goal, and Tiernan Kelly scores. That's exactly what I know they would have been told to do. So, um, again, that, that's what's going to frustrate them. Do you know, they, they give Monaghan too much of a platform to create dangerous opportunities in the first half. Yeah, no, they definitely did. So, like, I mean, then they're two points up. Like, I mean, the, the momentum's with them. And amazingly, the game switched around again, Colm. And that's more, you know, uh, Conor McManus using his brain. I was making sure not to say Kieran McManus. I have a habit of doing that <laughs> myself. And I saw people giving out. I think O'Rourke was calling him Kieran last night. Twice. Uh, twice. <laughs> I have done this on the show loads of times. But anyways, Conor McManus, right, the two frees at the end that I want to talk about, he bought one. Like, I mean, it was Kelly, wasn't it? Uh, that yeah, he, he's, that enti- awesome. he's entitled to slap at that ball. Like, I mean, that's the reality. McManus pre- kind of pretended he got in the face. No one's going to give out to him. He bought the free. The one before it was the stupid one where Monaghan are two points down and... Um, Armagh, all the pressures on Monaghan and Armagh give away a very, very soft free, uh, which was a free on McManus, Colin. Yeah, look, uh, everyone know, everyone knew in that ground, like uh, there was only one man that was going to get Monaghan back into that game. Like, And we we spoke around this before, around how, like, I know Tyrone, we always used to set up around McManus because just that, that's what made Monaghan tick. And I was just watching that game and the, coming in the fight, latter stages and going like, 
they're, they're going to go to McManus. They have to. They've nobody else. There's nobody else going to step up here and really take it, take the game by the scruff of the neck. And to be fair, look, you know, yeah, they probably bought one, but you, you know, he. The one thing about McManus is that he will never hide. He will never shirk responsibility. Uh, he came looking the ball. Um, you know, and look, you have to give credit. Uh, the freeze were delivered. He got the freeze and knocked him over. So look, there. You have to give him massive credit because he he, he really stood up there, um, the key man. It's very easy for him to, to, to have hidden because he, the, the momentum had shifted massively. Armagh were in the ascendancy, uh, you know, and you have to you know you have to take a hat off them. He, he, you know, okay, there might have been a uh, a, there's a bit of craft, uh, is what we'd call it probably in terms of uh, you know getting frees, but um, you know he had to, he had to put them over as well and 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 look. You know, we have to stand up and give him credit. Two uh, turnovers. Stephen Campbell, I don't, I'm not going to try and criticise Stephen Campbell. Like, I mean, anyone that played in that kind of heat for a full game, like, I mean, you know, you'd be about ready to faint at that stage. But in a weird way, Armagh were two up and they looked like the panic side at that stage, Aaron. Instead of maybe calming it down, you know, slowing things down, they were going hell-bent on this counter-attack. And I remember he gave one to McQuillan that was over his head and it ran away. That was a great opportunity. And then he gave another hand pass away in the middle. Instead of maybe just taking that bounce. I know it's against everything I stand for it during the game. But maybe, yeah. you know, leading at that end, just slow it down and go back. And then waste time by building it up slowly. Do you know? Like I remember talking to Rory Grugan before and he said that was something. Remember Armagh were trying to throw away leads all the time. And he was saying maybe we just need to manage the game a bit better and stop looking for that, you know, going to attack um, late in games. I suppose the the first one you're talking about uh, where the ball gets intercepted by McNasby where uh, Stefan goes to play it over the top. Like Ross McQuillan was gone. There was was nobody between him and Bagan. That for me was all, and that was going right. to kill the contest. Just didn't put enough weight on the ball, and, and McInnesby read it. Um, I think the biggest learning curve in terms of what the second half of Arma is that craft that you are talking about. Um, two or three times, I think what happened was they had come like at at the second the water break in the second half. There was it was still a stalemate. It was still seven points in it. Do you know, Arma hadn't got any closer. Yeah, they come like a freight train then. And there was no, they couldn't, they couldn't put the brakes on. There were just, Everton was still 100 miles an hour. Where there was a couple of opportunities where I felt they could have took on a man, stepped across the path and bought a free, which whenever we were one, two points up, that would have seen them three, four points up, you know. So that's the, that craftiness um, that I suppose comes with experience that the, the boys who had the ball are, first second seasons you know and probably get caught up in the whole emotion of like the crowd started to get behind Armagh then you had the Armagh chanting coming you know it was the place was alive um, and I think maybe players just got caught up a wee bit in the emotion of it yeah, oh, absolutely you know but again massive learnings have to, have to come from that because Conor McManus was cool and composed and focused on what he what he had to do and like I said uh, had the craft to to do what had to be done uh, to to get two frees to to draw level and then put them one up. Um, but I did see Geezer made reference to it. You know that um, it's something that they will have to learn from in terms of being able to see games out in those situations where you just show that wee bit more composure. Um, yeah, it's it's massively difficult, and that you know just even for my last few years, like whenever you're you get ahead of steam and you're you you think things are going well and. You're trying to find a balance between killing the game, um, and try, you know trying to push on and really kill the game to, you know, start going laterally again. I'm nearly doing what like if Arma had to stop and start to go lateral and slow it right down. There was a fear then that Monaghan pressed up and nipped them anyway. Um, you know because Monaghan did that in the second half. I I, I, I say I give Arma massive credit, but Monaghan did sit back and they did sort of. I know as a you know as a player yourself, or guys like that, you're you're sitting that big a lead and you go in a bit of a comfort zone. Whenever Arma get in the sense, if they had to start to play about, but you know, it only would have took a misplaced pass here and there as well. Um, so, like in a way, I can't really blame them. Um, yeah, they, they, they probably did. They probably could have shown a wee bit more composure. But uh, you know, if they had a, if they had a pushed on and kicked another two or three points, that was game over anyway. So yeah, no, I take your point. Like I mean, I like you know, if it's working and you stop doing it, the, the analysis afterwards will just stop doing it. And yeah. you know, I do accept yeah. that. Like I mean, it, it can be a little bit of hindsight. It was maybe just a bit of composure from yeah. Stefan Cam. You know, calm down. Like yeah. you know, but. Maybe when it was working for them, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably be able to take that point. What about the dubs here? What are we reading into this? I refuse to jump on this dubs in crisis bandwagon um, after the Wexford match. It's a first round away from home. We've seen it before. No big deal. 
First half, very good. Second half, like you, if Dublin are 11 points up in Leinster, you're looking at the handicap, you're looking at a, demoli- you know, a demolition, you're, and like you're looking at them falling apart in the second half, which, like, do we read something into this, Aaron? Like, I mean, is, is, there, is there, like, it's still a very strong Dublin team, but is there something going on there that, that, that's affecting their level of performance? Yeah, I seen Jerry here last week and he used the word unnerving and again, everything that they've done, it's very hard for you to turn around and say it's that big of a crisis. But I, I just looked at, it was an online programme I seen and I, I seen the bench that they had and they've just hemorrhaged that many top players, that many players, even impact players off the bench. You're, you're Kevin McManaman, who, who's going to come in with a different dynamic that they're going to be so hard to replace. So, I don't know whether it is a mixture of um, the amount of players that they have lost um, or whether there is some different issue that we, we maybe don't know about. Um, do you know, It's just so hard to tell because you get no feedback out of them whatsoever. No. But there, there's definitely a change in dynamic there. Um, it, it is very hard whenever you have a core group of players who are running everything and, you know, carrying the same sort of culture ethos that's within a group and, and you have new faces coming in I get that up the middle the same still have the same sort of spine but they definitely don't seem to have the same aura or the same um, I can't even think it's invincibility the, 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 the composure like to go whatever it was from the 37 minute to the Seven, they only score two points yeah. like for Dublin at, in Crow Park where you have your wide open spaces like yeah. they, they go to town in you in those situations um, and I suppose it's just you never see them rattle the way just their body language you just knew Jesus these boys are yeah. they're in a game and for, for me to take them back to three points like um, like huge credit to me because again they could have said Jesus here we go again another trimming from Dublin and Crow Park um, but they, they, they turned it around it's a, it's a bit of both Dublin obviously fell way off their standards and made to be fair um, they, they really rolled up the sleeves they, they definitely did. like I mean maybe it's the weather maybe we're 11 points up and all those you know excuses that would go into their heads this game's over it's very 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 it's very hot Dublin Dublin, don't yeah, do Dublin that. that's what you associate yeah. with maybe Jim Gavin's Dublin yeah. you know last year was a weird championship you know it was a very easy championship for Dublin they were never really tested it was as handy a, an All-Ireland as they'll ever win it was in the middle of winter you know I, I, it, it's a completely different championship this year I, may, I don't know but there, there seem to be tested a little bit and it's amazing there was only three points in it like we said until the, they did show that leadership and that experience but like if you it's a tale of two penalties in the first half column like it was a stonewall penalty for McMahon with Fenton coming in behind him I would have thought a tackle from behind tripping him up and then you have this soft a penalty for Fenton up the other end of the field where Fenton was Lavin slapped him going past which you're allowed to do and Fenton was falling even before young Costello came near him and Costello fell on top of him because Fenton had already started falling I would have given those penalties absolutely the other way around Yeah look I think we're, we'll be all in agreement with that um, the, the, you know the first one like when you're when you're coming from behind somebody um, and coming to tackle in from behind like that's why you step across your man. If you were running out in the middle, out, out around the middle of the pits or anywhere on the field, and you've got to step on somebody, you step across him because yeah. he has two he has two things to do: either trips you up or lets you go. Um, so the same principle applies to that first one where he, he had a cross. Fenton was coming behind him, bundled him over. It, like there was absolutely no doubt that was a penalty. Fenton's was soft. Um, it was sort of yeah. He slapped across him, um, and you know. I've definitely would have seen a lot of time referee waving the hand to say get up, get up, you know. Yeah. Um, because that slap across like, him, that slap across him column wouldn't have made him fall forward. If anything, it would have made no, him kind of fall no. back around the other way. It was soft. There was no, there's no doubt about it. And I think you would, you would have been talking about it anyway. Um, you know, if they had got it. But I think the emphasis here is on the Mees. Like the Mees should have had a penalty. And regardless of what you know, obviously we'll have the other end get and Dublin get one, but. The big thing was not giving the Meath one like like that. Like I'm not sure I think but uh, Conor Newman was in a right enough position to see it. Um, but I, I'm not sure how that wasn't that, that, that wasn't given. But to pick up where to pick up on uh, just the word Dublin or at like um like I always think back to Dublin whenever you know we we, we, we played them back in twenty eighteen and you know we've got a run on them and you know we thought geez we're gonna go to town in these guys and just over the last couple of years Dublin whenever a teams do get a run on them and start getting four or five points on them and you know you think you know we're, we're actually going to give us a crack 
they, they nearly know how to switch, and we always talk about them being able to switch mid game, whereby they're, they're maybe under a wee bit of pressure. You know, against us in twenty eighteen, they reverted back to everyone behind the ball, maybe bar one, and they sucked us in and hit us for a few goals, and you know, then nearly expanded back out again and destroyed us. So, like, I, I we we seen it in the league as well. D- Dublin aren't they're not putting teams away this is the way they used to when they're when they're on top, and they don't seem to be able to. I don't know what's happened. Whether it's the personnel switches, uh, whether it's Jim Gavin or whatnot, they're not able to seem. They're not. They don't seem to be able to. You know, whenever teams are getting the purple patches, they're not able to actually just you know defend as well as they used to be. Whether it's a system thing, whether it's personnel, it's, it's very hard to, to put your finger on it. But again, Aaron talked about the the bench and bringing McManaman and these boys on to, to, to make changes. The guys that came on at the weekend, like unfortunately, they didn't they didn't make a massive impact. Um, so many uncharacteristic. You know, shots missing easy shots. Uh, maybe the wrong get getting the wrong guys on the ball. Um, like David Byrne had a shot, maybe straight from a goal. Uh, things like that. You just don't associate it. But I, I'm not saying to hit. A, I'll, I'll be hitting a high panic button. Um, but there's definitely people talking about the chinks, and they're, they're there. So it will give other teams a wee bit of, you know, a wee bit of. It will give the Tyrones and carries and whatnot, and a wee bit of hope um, going forward. The I suppose uh, Merchant and McDade are big losses because it's not so much that they're big losses themselves. It's Howard goes back to the forwards and McCarthy goes to midfield because the coffee burn looked a bit off the pace. He's a big lump of a lad, more of a winter probably footballer. I'm not sure he's going to be a, a Croke Park footballer. So there's a few different. It, it remind me of Kennedy from Tyrone, kind of a big kind of big lump of a fella. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's hard to really. We won't know about Dublin. Maybe there is chinks in the armor. I was saying no last Thursday, and now I'm starting to think, geez, Mike got that a little bit wrong last weekend. You said that the few switches you said that if you have some more defenders back, James McCarthy goes in midfield. You have him and Fenton as Rolls Rice midfield. Yeah. You have uh, Brian Howard back up front. It does change another the kick out yeah, option. Yeah, exactly. It changes the, the, the dynamic of them all right. But how how quickly those boys going to get back? Are they going to pick up other injuries? You know, everyone's have men going down with injuries these days. So yeah. like I said it's just if you take the whole of them in terms of the replacements or who can go into different lanes, they definitely just don't have the same. Uh, and, and, they couldn't possibly have the same generation of players yeah. coming through again, uh, the same quality. Jeez, if they do, we're all we're all <laughs> screwed. What about Mead, lads? Like, I mean, Mead are on the rise. There's no doubt about that. Young Hickey and Costello look right good players now. Wing back, wing forward. Costello really has something about him. And so the two of them have rate them really, really highly. Then you have like Shane Walsh to come back in. He played for a couple of years, still a very young player. He's injured. Jordan Morris looked very good. Ryan Jones. Like they competed so well at the Super 8s two years ago. And like we know they have a great defence. Um, Ryan Jones back in midfield with Menton you have Shane Walsh you have Costello who look very good Morris like they're beating Dublin regularly at underage level like give me three, four, five years and Mead will be you know contesting maybe for Leinster like they're not really now let's be honest but like I mean they're definitely on the way on the right uh, track Yeah, like you're, you're looking at uh, Andy McIntyre there and he has done a great job with them like you can see as the years has gone by with him there you can see number one the physical condition of them um, like I'm not sure they could be doing anything more physically in terms of their preparation than what they are doing I think what they just have been lacking and it's particularly up front is just that bit of traditional mid class where ball winners able to kick off right and left foot but you're starting to see that coming through like, like Costello's goal yesterday uh. co- coming through like I can see why there was a bit of a battle between uh, Bernard Flynn and, and Andy McIntyre in terms of getting those two boys and having them available Um. For me, to close that gap you're talking about, I think the whole county needs to be on a one. So you'd be, from a neutral, be a bit disappointed that that couldn't have been sorted out a bit more amicably. But in terms of to have the composure to go straight through, dummy solo off the left, yeah. step the keeper and roll it in off his right foot. Like that was class from a 20 year old. Um, so I think even in terms of his confidence and um, his growth at that level, he's definitely going to be someone that he can help bring that forward lane to another level where he kicked, I think it was one, two yesterday. He's hit a free he's hitting freeze um, you'll not find till that's growing to one five, one six a game and then that's whenever Mead are starting to, to go into another level then. yeah he looks like an ex- he looks like an excellent player we'll leave it there lads We're going to, I was going to talk a bit about Kildare but we'll do that in performance of the weekend with Daniel Flynn we just didn't see enough of that get those two games last night lads like I understand it's weird during the league the Sunday game went kind of away from showing the extended highlights of the games that were on TV and they, they showed more of the ones that weren't on TV and then last night I was watching it this morning. They went back to showing the Tyrone Donegal one extended highlights. We've all watched that. You give me a GA man that has not sat down and watched that bloody match. Like, unless there's a massive excuse. 
and the two Leinster ones we didn't really see and we saw very little of those ones so we're kind of like back to that I accept the Armagh the Armagh Monaghan one was on Sky so a lot of people wouldn't have seen that so you know show those highlights I would have swapped either Mead Dublin or Kildare Westmead with, the, with showing the Donegal Tyrone one again but here's me talking we'll be talking about Donegal and Tyrone next Donegal 114, Tyrone 23 points and we're going to try and be disciplined and stick within 20 minutes of this lads or we could be here all day we have a part 3 um, to come as well like I mean when I saw this Tyrone team pick column I was like, what the hell is going on? You have four wing backs in the forwards. You have Maddie Donnelly, who you'd say maybe is a midfielder, could even be a halfback. You go five halfbacks and Darren McCurry. Richie Donnelly was dropped and um, who else was dropped out of the forward? Oh, and young Don- Paul Donaghy. Now, Paul I was thinking, geez, this is a very, very defensive team. This is like a Mickey Hart team. What are they doing? I thought this was a new Tyrone and I was saying, this is a load of bullshit. And then you kind of stop and think and go, was McShane fit? Was... Was um, McKenna fit for a full game? What, Canavan's obviously out. You know, Paul Donaghy, to be fair, since the very first game, he hasn't been good and he didn't even appear at all. So then you're wondering, was, was that team forced on Tyrone or did Tyrone pick that team? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I do genuinely believe it's relating to probably the guys who aren't fully fit. Um, and like, I'm just thinking of the other options that Tyrone had. Um, that Mark Bradley, obviously, who hasn't started a game, um, I don't think this year, and Michael Conroy, who's a lad from our club, he's a young lad, he's only you know he's only he hasn't kicked any any football for Tyrone. So, you know, McShane probably not fully match fit. McKenna, uh, I'm not really sure whether he's fully match fit. So yeah, and Richie, I think, was injured as well or part injured. So I think it was more forced. I think you know they had no real, they had no really other, other options. A lot of what you would call out night forwards uh, just weren't fully fit and. It's a big risk to play somebody injured, and that's like we've seen that in the past where I've done it myself, where you've maybe even you've been half injured, not playing, maybe not feeling hundred percent, and you always want to push through that pain barrier and say to the management, "Yeah, look, I'm fully fit, I, I crack on here." But uh, that's a massive risk at this t- stage in knockout football. So I, I do think the guys would probably err in the side of caution to play a fully fit player. Uh, a lot of them guys we, we talked about the the Milers and McGearys, these guys. The same guys can all obviously, obviously show us the weekend. They can they, they, they can mix it up. Um, so I do think it was forced. I think the guys had uh, their hand was forced. And you know, look, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad uh, few players to be bringing on uh, in the second half. Like, you know, no. they obviously made uh, a good bit of difference. They made they made a good bit of so Michael O'Neill marked Mogan and Connor Myler marked McEwen. They did that exactly like they did in the league. And Frank Burns dropped back pretty much into a kind of a sweeping position. Here, the, the question, because it was more of a defensive display and a running game and a counter attack game, which in those conditions probably what like all this is hindsight. Oh, they won, and lots of pe- people replying back to my tweet on Twitter going, "Oh, what would you know? Look, twenty three points." And I was like, "He didn't say that at the time, though." You know, everything <laughs> afterwards, like I would have said before the time, a running game in those sweltering conditions after using the kicking game well with McCurry last time. Like, again, I have to keep qualifying this by saying this could have been forced on them by the lads not, you know, not being fully right and maybe Donaghy being off form. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too sure um, what to think of it. Yeah, I, I would agree in terms of whether ways would have, if I was in management, you'd be thinking this has to have a bearing. But like I said, if that is the case and that's all you, you've fit and available, who's fit to go 100% from the very start, you just have to go with it. Yeah. Um, the, the thing about the, a lot of those thrown players, your middle third players, is they are so adaptable. Um, the game is very fluid. The only concern I probably would have had with it is that it, it those guys nearly lead you to a complete running game because you can't mix it up because none of them are going to play your half forward where they're going to be your outlet they're going to run from one wing to the next to receive a foot pass out so it was a complete swing in terms of how they, they have been trying to set up to play um, but yeah. th- th- to be fair like there was times where again and I'm sitting looking at the, the game and I, I know there's you would have seen debates between Osher McConville and Mickey Hart and this past few weeks in BBC and kicking ball in like what Darren McCurry's done this past two weeks to play a so deep because Everton was like I know football has probably changed a bit in terms of the amount of people that are back but he's so dangerous inside he's not coming outside the 21 all his runs are inside and they're picking him out with 
quality ball but even and it wasn't much yesterday last there were week. more hand passes yesterday y- y- compared yesterday to kick was, passes against Tyrone but he's staying inside and still able to get those balls and, and get the scores away so like that's a different dynamic than probably we have seen uh, for, for a number of years and granted then you had Tiernan McCann coming on three points you had Sludden coming from deep three points um, that's the traditional stuff that we have seen with, from them but it is there's a nice blend to them that I think if they can get a full squad back together they can mix and match uh, throughout the game how they really want to play and they have two weeks now to, to get a bit more fitness into the likes of McShane um, McKenna and those boys and um, they'll be very well set up because you can see them starting to build a complete squad um, now and, and numbers all over the field um, which obviously didn't look great whenever it was whatever it was four or five weeks yeah. old but, but here, 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 here's a question right have the answers from Killarney been answered yesterday Colin because if you're bringing Mac Shane back in there you're bringing Connor McKenna you're bringing Dara Canavan all three you'd imagine will start for Tyrone you're not you're not playing with the same shape you might be leaving three up instead of two and you know Dara Canavan won't be as good maybe as Frank Burns dropping back or you know or, or one of these more hard working players like did, did Tyrone answer the questions or did they make a scratch their heads going you know what, what's going what, I, I, I don't I, I sound like I'm coming across even critical of them here after scoring 23 points and winning oh. but I've parked the Killarney day like I said I said this after it like the the we we I don't know what it is we've just had bad days down there I'm literally forgetting about that game um and like just looking at what I'm seeing at the moment and look the adapt Tron adapted obviously forced whatever team they had to play they obviously had to get their some of their key uh, start what we call it night forwards and they adapted um and they brought some of the get the guys in. I, I think I think if they can get um, if they can get these guys over the next two weeks back firing, look the, the key for Toronto at the moment is that they, they they have so much they have so much power in the bench, which you know I would have been saying for the last couple of years we've had the same thing. I would have been saying like there's there's good players on the bench. You, you're nearly you are replacing like for like I think Ferguson and Brands piece of trying to just find the right guys in the right positions is going to be the blame. Like Matty Donnelly, for example, hasn't probably been in his top form the you know the last few weeks, but there at the weekend there in the second half, you know, a prime example, once he gets one on one with somebody, he's able to go past, he's able to kick scores. You know, you talked about him maybe being a, a mid, natural midfielder or maybe closer defender. These guys are all very adaptable. Um the, the, the key sort of mix at the moment for Tyrone is who do you play where? Um, can, you know, and you have to be able to adapt against certain teams. Against the Donegal, that open kicking game that we probably seen against Armagh Mon- like the Norma Monning game probably wasn't really on as much. Um, so they had to actually run it. Um, so you know, coming looking forward to 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 the to the Monaghan game, you know that is Monaghan going to be that open again uh, to, against Strong? I don't think they will. I think they'll revert back a wee bit. And, and, and if they if they do leave it the way they did against Armagh. They, I, I think Toronto will go to town on them because they have so much attacking threat. Um, the key will be getting the guys back from injury. And I say, look, the, the, there'll be head scratching moments in that Toronto camp um, but to, to see who starts where because the, the guys that are coming on are, are making an impact and making differences. Um, so, yeah, it's all up for grabs. Yeah. yeah. Matty Donnelly was under pressure at half time. Like, I mean, his only real contribution in the first half was knocked it down to McCurry. Frank Burns had a great intercept, and the first time Tron kicked it, they got it down there and McCurry should have scored a goal but in the second half you know when Matty Donnelly's going to take you on you can, he almost lines up for it he tells the whole stadium I'm going to go at this lad here so I thought Hugh McFadden was at fault for his couple of points and Peter Hart got a handy one from that side too like just handy ones where if you were back there McFadden Mc, you could see McFadden coming into the shot late on all the three on the three kind of scores and he got taken off pretty soon after that <sighs> probably in fairness to Hugh we might put conditions down to, to that for him where he the best will in the world your your brain's telling you I need to be 20 <laughs> metres over there but whether the lungs and, and the head take you there is a, or the legs take you there is a different story um, but yeah it for, for Maddie like it, it's a while since we've seen that that bit of zip in him. Like, I think in particularly the one where he takes on McManaman, who's a big, strong fella, but he just throws him out of the way, takes a couple of steps and, and lets fly. Too often, I, I think he's just been too passive in his play. I don't think we've seen him that direct for a number of years, realistically. Like everything he's doing, he's getting it. He's nearly soloing on the spot and just... You know, Pat, nearly, the, the nearly Kieran afraid, Kilkenny yeah. from three yeah. or four years ago, something similar to that. There, like afraid of getting doubled up on, maybe or giving it away. You know, just afraid to go into that contact because he's he's so good. 
He's so powerful. He can be so direct. I don't. I don't believe whenever he's doing that stuff, that's not his strengths. Anyone can nearly do that there. Yeah, not yeah. Maddie. Maddie Donny's too good to be doing that there. And I think what we've seen in the second half was maybe a switch back to the old Maddie Donny that was winning all stars. Um, and if you're column and a throne perspective, um, it's it's massively positive. Um, but again, I think their their big thing is where is everyone's best positions here because I think if they can find the right mix, I think what happened and how exposed they were against Kerry uh, granted maybe that might have been a one-off t- to that extent I think if they get the right people in the right place because they have such a blend of physicality speed um, they won't give away them opportunities or they'll be able to, to cover dangerous situations better um, so he said it's, it's a great headache for their management to have over the next few weeks um, in terms of they'll probably have a full hand to pick from um, yeah. which will leave them they'll be well set up for we'll it. see yeah we'll see what they're actually trying you know pl- planning on doing as yeah. regards their first team Wait, we, we can't talk about this match without talking about the Murphy sending off it came just after a penalty miss we probably all agree the penalty probably is a bit of a harsh call against Tyrone that you know he was going to go for a point he was fouled <laughs> didn't seem to be a goal scoring opportunity because McKiernan was coming across and like, harsh anyways he, that was missed so there was probably justice done in that the sending off column like I mean Donegal we know are not the same team as Murphy it's a huge body blow psychologically in that kind of gruelling heat you know McFadden's dropping back as a sweeping player you're losing Murphy it's nearly like you're losing two players out around the middle third and Tyrone have loads of bodies out around there to be honest Donegal were just hanging on I always felt in the second half the goal kept them in it but they were hanging on in the second half you know 14 men had a bi- did have a big bearing on it yeah I thought you give Donegal did you have to give them credit they, they hung in and yeah. stuck with Throne for like the, the second half the Murphy sent off was massive like once he went off I was you know I was sort of watching the game going Throne need to really capitalise and push up here and really go at them and, and, and they did to be fair and like Donegal stayed with them stayed with them played some really nice football but they were inevitably going to run out of like they were going to run out of steam um, and I know the last 10 minutes when Kieran went off whatever that you know Throne did actually ask when Throne sort of kicked in the gear but I, I felt that Tyrone were getting their scores much easier. Um, you know, they were whenever they wanted to score, they seemed to be able to get them, and they were under very, you know, not a massive amount of pressure. Donegal were having to work a lot harder. I think I felt for their scores, and that that to me watching that for the last you know twenty minutes, I was going, I was fairly confident that uh, that Tyrone would come through. Um, look, nobody wants it's an, it's, a, it's very unfortunate for Murphy. Like and nobody. Nobody wants to see anyone get sent off in, in championship knockout football because it does, and especially a delegate was going to be a it was going to be a massive uh, it was going to be a massive impact on it. And like Donny Gall, um, without you know, we always talked about Murphy, McHugh, um, McBrearley, and they were the, obviously you know you have Langan and whatnot, but the M three were always the key for me in terms of can't her own shut these down. And Myler ultimately obviously loves Mark and McHugh. He's always had that sort of edge over him never like you know and as and obviously again had a good game at the weekend and um you know McBrady was fairly quiet as well and then when Murphy went off uh, you know it it, it it was bound to be a massive deflation for Donny Gall but look give them give them credit they, they stuck to their task well and they, they did they were able to pick off scores um but you know ultimately they were you know, they were, I thought they were always going to fall short in the end. Yeah, I, d- I definitely thought they were. Like, even when they got the goal, you still thought that they were clinging on. It was almost like a rugby goal, that one was, Aaron. It was like a slip pass to someone running off to another slip pass. It was Ryan McHugh on into Bang Gallagher, I think, and then to McGonagall. Like, I mean, it was like out the line to rugby and then bang to the net. Again, they scored that, but you still felt, you know, Tyrone, you know, are too strong for them with the extra man. Yeah, I think if you just look at Michael's body language even going off and it was one of his selectors or something at halftime, the camera panned him and he was just was so deflated that I think the selectors nearly saying just whatever you do, if you can just come in and just try and be positive, be upbeat even with your body language. But um, it, it's such a blow to them. I always again felt the game's over here. I couldn't see them as much as they did fought very, very bravely and, and tried their best. Uh, and that needs to be pointed out. They did. Oh, massively. Like, they didn't drop the head. Like, everyone talks about take Murphy out, they have nothing. Like, they did everything that they could. Man down, sear and heat. Um, he's just that big of a presence for them. Uh, if I just go back to it, like, maybe it's just old-fashioned or whatever, but his first yellow card... I don't want to see yellow cards for that there. Like, you can foul someone and not have to get a book in, in But he in made no attempt to play the ball. He was getting something on him. And I'd say, look, you should nearly want that out of the game as well. Murphy <sighs> does like getting a, something on I, some lads. He, 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 he does, but 
I think there still needs to be a level of physicality where you're not any yellow. The second one... But he's just hitting him there, rather. Like, he's not trying to tackle the ball. He's not even pretending to tackle the ball. He's just... He's he's getting a... a, a, a I thought, like, I wouldn't You'll have You'll see plenty of that, yet. though, all, all yeah. over the field, continuously. If like he for, did it with his shoulder, I wouldn't mind. But he did it with his two hands, like, I mean... Yeah, uh, for, for, for me... It's cost him. It's not it, a it, yellow it, and Ulster football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or cost him football, wherever you want to call it. I, I, I'd like to see just sometimes just, just like what the second one. I have no idea. I think he just it's brain fog or something out there. I don't know why he pulls in it because the ball wasn't even going to go anywhere. Any, it just was split second reaction. Missed the got, penalty. Yeah, and he he pulls his foot back nearly as he's doing it because he knows he drops the head after he knows Jesus. I'm in trouble here. Like one way or another, he was gone. Whether it was black or yellow, yeah. he was gone. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a massive blow. And again, it just from neutral sitting looking at it, it um, I think it sort of it made the whole feel the thing feel a wee bit more inevitable at that stage. Ah, oh, well, it did. Like most people would uh, would agree with that. That after missing the penalty and then him going off, like the tide had completely turned. What about Conor McKenna? Um, talking about a fella, right? Hasn't had the greatest season. He's had a phantom injury that even Ben in work there won't tell you about, um, Colm. And we have a situation where he comes on the field he kicks a wide then he goes up with an Aussie rules catch with the knee in the back and fouled now I, to be honest I didn't think I wasn't sure that was even a foul are they fouls in GEA Sometimes, if you yeah. catch it clean it's not a foul but if you don't catch it maybe it is a foul I don't know but then he kicks a ball yeah. over the sideline and I'm thinking Jesus this lad's head completely gone or what and then you, you know Colm you can take it away the rest yeah. you know he turned it around completely the, the, the knee in the back, nobody. I don't think actually anybody knows whether that's a free or not because you said if you, if somebody catches it, everyone goes oh, unbelievable yeah. catch. That's great to see in the sport. And then nearly if if you're if, if he doesn't get it, right, uh, you have free the other way. So uh, they're sort of I'm not sure about the rule book. We need to pull that uh, pull the rule book out. Not want to see what the what the, what's that's given for. But yeah, look, uh, Connor. Uh, strangely, I, I had a, I'm not sure why he obviously wasn't starting um you know whether it was an injury or whether they've just held him back I, 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 literally sort of thrown have been fairly tight lipped on that and rightly so but look the lad came in and he made a few mistakes um and and a lot of other players would have you know put their head down and maybe hit hit sort of hide a wee bit and sort of keep but what, what tends to happen when you make a few mistakes together like especially when you're coming into a game you're going holy christ i've made two, two or three mistakes here i need to start doing things simple and you know, start laterally passing, and you know, you know, you're really focusing and making it making things so simple to, to sort of get yourself in the game. But to be fair to McKenna, made a few errors, and I was sort of scratching my head, going, "Is he going to? You know, what's going to? This isn't looking good for him." But he, one of the players, obviously, the ball comes in, he comes right in front of McCreary, takes the ball, knocks the ball away from, him, and then takes off up the line, uh, gets the ball, and lays it into McCurry, I think, yeah. and McCurry slots it over the bar, like and. That play alone, you know, shows that he was not faced at all. He he made a he made a obviously some from really ran the full length of the pitch nearly uh, for a layoff and uh, and burnt somebody up the line while, while, while doing it. So look, you know, McKenna's he hasn't like obviously when he came back last year there was massive uh, attention to him and, and he delivered. He he was unbelievable for throwing last year. This year has been a wee bit stuttering in terms of where where is the best to play him. You know, is he an inside forward? Is he going to be playing in half midfields? People talk about playing him at six. You know, I don't think we'll find the best probably position for him. Um, but look, when he came into the game and uh, at the weekend, I was sort of panicked a wee bit. But he he steadied the ship for Tyrone, and you know, I think he'll continue to grow. I think he'll uh, the more games he gets, um, I think the team, I think the Fergal and Brown will probably play him in a number of different positions uh, to, to try and find out his best. But it's, 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 it's getting late, late in the day. We're going into an Ulster final now. You know, it's not an easy one to call. If he was injured, then well, well and good. You can you can justify not starting him. But if he, if he was fully fit and they've held him back, then that's a different story altogether because they're maybe scratching their head going, where do we play this lad? You know, a lot of people talked about maybe playing him in the middle. And look, it's just, uh, it's a, but back to the, what we talked about earlier with the mix of where Trump's you know what? What is Jones' best fifteen in terms of where they're playing? And I don't think they find that. Yet. Yeah, they haven't. Like I mean, I think it was Owen Van Gallagher he burned going down. He did run the length of the field. Well, he ran from one fourteen to the other fourteen, dispossessing a corner forward, ran the length of the field, and it seemed like he was getting faster the further he was running, and then just handed it off to McBrearty or look. I, I'm thinking McBrearty because that's the type of ball turning around McCurry. And um, we'll talk about McCurry and performance of the weekend. He just tapped it over the bar, and McKenna celebrated that because he knew the. But like then I'm thinking. 
maybe number six is the right position. Tyrone don't have a natural one and use him as a, like play your Frank Burns, drop him back like Armagh did with McGinney and uh, Tony McEntee and do a little thing like that. You mark him. McKenna, you're the spare man. Drop and help out when you want but I want you using that pace like Jack McCaffrey type you know pace yeah. that terrifies teams yeah and obviously his game in, in Aussie rules was before he went out he was a forward out there he was a half back so yeah. defensively in terms of having a bit of physicality reading the game it has to be yeah, in his game there. because he, he's done that for four or five years on professional basis um, but for me what I what I loved about that again you talk about all the mistakes he made he, he gets back he reads the interception but he went like the hammers and someone went to cut across him and he actually wheels out around him because he's like, you're not making contact with me because I'm going the full length of this field. He actually goes out about five yards and straight down the touchline. Um, nobody was catching him. Do you know, there was yeah. no... If you've seen him coming at that pace, you'd just be shouting, you're a man because <laughs> you, you don't want to be the man who's getting left behind. Uh, it, it just showed real intent for me. He, he, Colin had mentioned he didn't want to sit back and hide and just get the intercept. I've done my bit. He he went the full length of the field with, with pure intent. So for me, I, I think he'll be better. I, I think it's it's more difficult for him now to adapt to having his back to goal where that was his natural game. For five years of professional, his game was seeing pockets of space, looking ahead, saying when, when's, or where's my pl- place to run or when's my time to run into space here. Um, I think that's now his, his natural natural game um, and I don't think any half forward wants to be to be on him if he's in that sort of form breaking up the field whether it is wing half back centre half back um, I think you put him in that position and just like Jack McCaffrey or your top player Jeremy McHugh's now Lee Keegan he's going to be putting his man in the back foot it's, it's another forward basically just coming running from deep yeah definitely is right we'll leave it there lads and we'll come back with performance of the weekend Okay, performance of the weekend. Um, first one is Rian O'Neill. Aaron, I'm going to throw this one to you. Well, the two of you. Um, I remember saying after the Donegal game last year, I was critical of Rian O'Neill. He wasn't in that game and he was doing a lot of trying to get on the ball and take frees and look like maybe like a Kieran McDonald type player. And I remember saying, you're a big man. Get out and win some kickouts. Get your team stuck into it and get in the game. That's what, you're de- that's what you should be looking to do instead of trying to look fancy. Well, he certainly did that at the weekend because he drove his team back into it. He still kicked a few lovely scores as you know he always is but he showed that he's a warrior now and he hit Ryan Wiley and he knocked him and he celebrated and I was like Jesus this lad now this is what he's all about that was in my head yeah it, it was it was an immense performance from him um, the first half it was his score and he ended up with five points um, I think it was two frees three from play um, he was an uh, inside, inside presence uh, throughout himself and Andrew Mornan caused most of the damage in terms of um, the 14 points they got yeah. uh, but it was really whenever the game looked like it was gone from them to move them out the centre half forward uh, he caught three marks um, but just demanding to get on the yeah. ball and they said maybe some of the trying to go short at times in the first half the second half it was just he was just kick the ball out just get it out on top of me there was times like he wasn't doing anything on his own you know he had Conor Boyle hanging out of him at times but there was one where he, he, he was holding off Conor Boyle on one arm and took it on his, le- on, on his right hand um, winning the, the mark and you know not slowing down not looking to go sideways or back the way straight up on his feet and bang full forward into Conor Torbett perfect flighted ball Albeit he got Conor Torbett wrote off with it, but um, <laughs> still a lovely ball. Yeah. Exactly, he's thinking danger. He's thinking we need a goal, get the ball in there as soon as possible. You know, and that really brought Arm out to life. So it's nothing that I, I didn't expect. Um, like I said to you before, you know, in terms of real himself deal. and and Ashley knows boys, they are they are the business. There's nothing that that he can't do. And I think what you've seen is a complete package. He, he would have known himself last year. Um, just maybe I don't know whether it was the way the season went or the way that Donegal game in particular went. He just never really got. More and never really got into it but he wasn't letting the weekend pass him by um, and I think just from, from an RMI perspective he, like I said before, he's, not a, he's not a big talker um, or he, he'll not be going around giving speeches and change rooms or anything out there just give him the football um, he'll demand the football give him the ball and that's whenever he's he's happiest and he's at his most comfortable and I say from an RMI perspective um, it's brilliant to have someone of those leadership qualities in terms of what he does on the actual field yeah it was absolutely and his brother Ushin he deserves a mention as well he was outstanding too I remember one move in the first half where Rian 
buried off the outside of the boot to Ushin and Ushin gave a great hand pass across the goal. I think it was O'Hanlon running onto it. If he O'Hanlon had a bit more speed, it would have been it would have been a goal. Ushin stood up as well. He scored a real inspirational point column, you know, where he was just had his man in front of him and just went, This is an important time for me to stick one over and did a little Jaff Allen kind of shuffle <laughs> and went out to the right and stuck it over the bar. Yeah, I can't remember. I was I just remember thinking that was a really important point for him. I'm not sure of the uh, scoreline at, at, at that point in time but I remember just thinking look that is proper quality like that is you know you stand your man up yeah. it's, a, it's an important key, key moment in the game I'm going to take you on unless he can you can you stab me even out the outside I'm not sure long range point uh, I'm thinking these guys are like, you know watch them two guys the weekend like they are uh, I hadn't seen a massive amount of them over the last uh, last while but this year especially Rain and Oshin like they're you would they'd start in any team in the in the country, and like they they, they really took the especially Ryan, Obviously, he he took the he took the game by, by the scruff of the neck. Um, whenever our man needed something, he came up with the goods. Whether it was a catch, whether it was a long ball in, you know, I think he finished. What did he finish with? What with three point? Was it three? Three, four? three from play. Yeah, for Oshin. Three, three from play. So like a, you know, a massive. Uh, Massive performance from both of them, yes. Yeah. Jack McCarron, another one, um, Aaron. Like, I mean, scored 1 1. He went out of it in the second half, fair enough. But Jesus, he it was he demolished our man the first half. Like, I mean, I've, we've already criticised Mackay on him not being t- tight enough. He suffered by big, getting taken off. He was, uh, he was, you know, involved in all four goals, scoring one, setting involved directly in two, and then setting up the other one to give it to McInespy. He was all over the place. And, like, I mean, he was being found. As well, he just strikes me as a player that how many players might we have kind of seen or lost over the last ten years, like McCarran, who with defensive systems, where like when you give the man a bit of space and give it into him, this is what the likes of him he can do. Yeah, I think what you have seen this past few years with Seamus McNeeny back is that kicking the ball over the bar has never been never been an issue for him. You know, he he's accurate. Um, I think. He didn't really know whether he was going to make it or not. He seemed to be on the team, off the team, on the Malachi Rock. He, he's set in stone there now and he's playing with that there confidence. And I think nothing more sort of encapsulates it than the goal he created for, for Bannigan. Like, is naturally he was turning, first instinct was shooting, then just the off the cuff drag back dummy to go through. But at that stage in his mind, he senses blood. He's looking to kill that game off and finish it. Yeah. Goes in and he even, he, he, he steps Conor Mack and as if he's going to his right again and uh, takes another step back on to his left and that draws Mack into him which frees up Bannigan straight through so just the composure the rootless streak in him you know that he was looking to to make sure he put this game to bed that's someone who's playing with massive confidence um, and I suppose he takes he takes a huge weight off Conor McManus you know, in terms of, of scoring because for a long time it was solely him in the big games um, and for him to be able to chip in he kicked a lovely one with his right foot again where he'd led to the right hand side double back onto the left and then just chipped it straight over with his right foot um, so someone who is playing with, with massive confidence and he's also able to bring others uh, into the game with him as well yeah. um, so it was definitely in the first half like everything that was that was being fed through him um, same thing with the ball out in front just a wee simple pop pass to, to Darren Hughes knowing when to do the right thing at the right time sometimes you'll see a forward who'll use Darren as a bit of a decoy and tap it Go over the, the bar way. themselves um, he did what was best for the team at that stage and uh, that was a fourth goal that he created off it he scored one and gave the last pass for two yeah we, we, we talk a lot about Tyrone uh, column and you know how they're cha- the new management is changing the style of play and we very rarely talk about Banty and Donny Buckley and their backroom team and they've transformed Monaghan in just as, as much a way as Tyrone are trying to change they've done it into a kicking team, into leaving mo- as many forwards up as you can, a very attacking half forward line, and playing through a half forward line, getting the ball in. They kind of, he's kind of done it under the radar, hasn't he? Hasn't he, called him? Like, I mean, I don't. Yeah. Maybe Monaghan don't get the credit they deserve a lot of the time, and I'm holding my own hands up on that. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, like, I suppose all of us in Ulster football have uh, we've been sort of trained and taught over the last number of years of how to play against pack. You know, packed defenses, getting men behind the ball, counter attack and whatnot. And I suppose it's it's very easy for Tyrone to say, look, we're you know we're changing everything. We're going back to lot you know three or four up and a lot more direct kick passing because of the new management. But these guys have come in on the radar. Like the thing about Monaghan at the moment, they're able to do it all. Um, and we've seen it at the weekend where you know obviously the first half they were very direct. You know, Arma given you know left left a lot of spaces and they're obviously Monaghan cut them open so they were able to get the long drag balls in 
uh, to McManus and McCarran and these guys and get the scores. But when they needed to, they, they were able to revert back to what I suppose they were, what I would have thought they would be, or known them to be good at, is, is coming out from the starting out of the wings, you know, cutting inside, you know, nearly emulating Ben, I guess, uh, obviously more behind the ball and that. So they, they have, they, they've definitely evolved. And I know they've been trying to, like, from chatting to a few of them on in guys over the last few years, they have made amp, like, they have gone in to try and make changes to this. And they, they're, they're like all, any of the teams at the moment to try to catch the dubs, or they know that we can't. Put fourteen behind the ball anymore and hope to win. Um, and like Tyrone, it's the balance piece is going to be key. Can they get the balance right? Because as I said earlier, if if, if Tyrone or Man if they leave that much space at the back of time the, against the Kerrys and the Dublins and and, and whatnot, there could be ten, eleven points down the championship game and not being able to claw it back. Um, but at the same time, they don't want to be negative. They don't want to put fourteen behind the ball and stay in the game and counter attack because ultimately we're not, not going to get enough scores at the other end. So. Um, we we'll have to give money and credit, absolutely. Um, that they've done this well, uh, you know, as you say, probably under, under the radar because a lot of the focus has been on the throne change in terms of change in management and styles. But uh, they, they definitely, we've seen it the weekend there, like they, they were able to do, they nearly reverted back to old school football for, for, for a full half of, of a game. And look, it was very, very entertaining. But um, I say it's, it's all about the key and the balance. We, we often talked on the show here, Aaron, myself and Keen Ward, saying even when teams were defensive, a lot of the time they were setting up along their 45, you know, and getting loads of bodies there. And we often said there's often a po- little pocket of space in behind that. But teams never really wanted to kick it over it. Maybe the, 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 the fear was that the, the opposition would double back and go in and double them up. But Monaghan were given a kind of over that Armagh one and showing that that can be done. You know, like if that kick pass is on, don't be afraid to bloody give it. Get it in there. And we saw what happened the, t- the, the times that they did. Yeah, and to be fair, like even say the last year I played for Armagh 2014, that, that's one of the main reasons why we caused Donegal so much trouble in that All-Ireland quarterfinal was because that's what we found, that their defensive cover was nearly from the 45 to the edge of the D. But inside, behind that was two on two. Do you know, but what happens is whenever you're on ground level, you're on the field, there's pressure in your championship game, you lift your head and look, all you see is a wall of Donegal yeah, players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's over that? It's easy to see know? that from the upper deck yeah, of Hogan's Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but because we had trained and we had looked at videos and we'd done our analysis on it, that's what we were looking for. So it was, don't get spooked or panicked by what you see directly in front of you. Try and look over that and see what's on. Um, now, that's what Monaghan did really well. Now, in fairness, they didn't have the pressure on them in terms of that final ball going in. There was no one on them, but they still that that's what they were looking for. You know, get it over this first wall of players. Um, what you need is the people out the field to have the ability and to have their head up and see it. But you need boys who are willing to be disciplined and stay inside and move smartly. That whenever they do receive it, they're in a dangerous position. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Kieran McGeary uh, got man of the match official one. Uh, Colin probably on his first half performance where he was out outstanding. Standing, um, you know, going forward, he played well in the second half. Got a desperate black card, I thought, and I wanted to talk about these type of black cards because they drive me up the wall. Now, the camera didn't pick up. The camera came onto it late, so you weren't sure did he step there. But it looked to me like uh, that McGeary was standing there. He put his hands up, turned his back. Now, why is it up to him? If he's standing there to jump out of the way of someone who gives a one-two, that that would be a completely unnatural thing to do. Why is the onus not on the fella who gives the one-two, passes it over defender? Should he not have to go around the defender if defender's only standing there? Why is why is it always in the attacker's favour there? Because let's be honest, all that's doing is promoting a lad, giving a hand pass, running straight into a man in front of him and falling down. Yeah, no, you don't. You, I don't think I didn't see it on the TV. I've obviously seen McGeary. It looked absolutely incredibly harsh it looks like he just stops he just stops dead uh where, where he's at and he said turns his back and he run it gets run into and black card you know i thought you're nearly having the my interpretation was that if like mcgeary had of actually continued his run in and um, the meter man then that of course is a black card but yeah. it, it didn't look like that at all on, on, the, on the television so um i i, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree it, if the man gives the ball he can't just run into the defender. He has to go out round, and most people do. So I, I felt it shouldn't have been. Uh, I think McGeary gave a, a, a lot of good credit to Joe afterwards anyway, so uh, to keep him on the right side. He, he, Kieran was uh, incredibly harshly done, I thought. Um, but look, that super performance. And look, this is something that's probably I've been crying out for the last few weeks with, with Kieran because he, he probably has. He's been taken off. He got yellow, he's got a lot of yellow cards over the league, and you're sort of hoping, geez, 
that you know you put in a good performance here at some point because I know it's a, like I know from playing with him that I, I know it's in him. He's a, he's a serious competitor, an all action type player yeah. involved in absolutely everything in the forward and and, and defending and. Sometimes it's a wee bit overzealous and tackles and whatnot, and, and that's why he probably results in the other yards. And the, the management team probably know that. But look, he kicked not three at the weekend um, and put in a real shift, like in terms of uh, going up. Man, probably could have had a goal as well. So look, he, he was, you know, he, he I thought he was super. I thought yeah. it's probably the best we've seen. We've seen him all year, and, and that's that for me has been probably the one thing I've been crying out for Throne this year is that your McGeary's, your Matty Donnelly's, your Sluddens, the guys who are sort of you would sort of associate driving the team on probably hadn't been doing it to a certain extent and you know we're seeing signs of that now yeah he gave I think he said uh, fuck in his interview with the BBC and uh, the interviewer then had to make a big deal apologising to the viewers give me a break it's a man just after playing a championship match getting man of the match and you know Sear and Heed his head was frazzled leave him alone and McGeary actually <laughs> apologised I would have left the apology to McGeary and just continued on with the interview like I mean instead of trying to completely embarrass the man talk to me about that. going back to you here Colm uh, Tiernan McCann What's going on there? Tiernan McCann walks onto that team, as far as I'm concerned, right half back. He's a much better all round player than Rory Brennan. Rory Brennan is a solid player, but he's nowhere near as dynamic as McCann. He, you know, he might be a better defender, but let's be honest, he can't do what Tiernan McCann does. Three points from play. Is there a personality issue here? Because we know what Tiernan McCann, right, he did the big dive in Crow Park. He li- he's into his haircuts. He remember him complimented me on my haircut here on the show as an interview. I really liked him, but you can see some people might think he's Flash Harry. Could Logan and Doer have been watching him for a few years going, I don't really fancy that fella now, you know, and, and nearly McCann's have to prove himself to them. Because for me, if, if, if you're playing a running game and you want Tyrone to have a running game, there's not a better halfback, you know, that in Tyrone surely at a running game than Tiernan McCann. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, lucky. I'm not sure whether it's anything to do with the personnel because, like, um, Tiernan, Tier, Tiernan's like, you're probably right. In terms of carrying the ball, he's very neat and tidy. He can kick off both feet. He doesn't really tend to make too many mistakes uh, in, in a game ever, but it really gives you a lot from halfback. Um, probably you, you've the likes of Michael O'Neill there, and you've the likes of Rory Brennan, who, yeah, like they're, they're more, they're they're in they're mar- they're markers, like they're more they're they're more competent, uh, you know, man marking people. Um, yeah. And that's I think they tried Michael O'Neill and Kieran uh, last week and and whatnot as well. So it, it could be just a tactical piece of, of of where they see the guys are at. Rory Brennan, to be fair, can he can attack as well. He can go forward. He's probably not as uh, as as comfortable as as Tiernan, um, obviously, but look, Tiernan had a, a super game at the weekend. He, you know, he's put himself, uh, he's put himself well in the mix to be to be starting the final. Um, so it'll be an interesting one whether to see whether he starts because like on Mer- and looking at the games, looking at looking at the game of the weekend, you, you'd feel that he probably has to start now because he put in such such a good performance. So, um, I'm not sure. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think there's anything there in terms of the. Uh, the guys just watching him over the years. I think he, you know, they just feel maybe the other guys are maybe better man on man markers. And, you know, you have to remember, it's all well and good going forward and kicking three points. You still have to, ma- you know, be able yeah. to defend. You know, maybe man on man, and and then sometimes players like Tiernan might fall out of that category. Uh, I know he can man mark, but you know, he's he's obviously a lot stronger going forward as well. So. Uh, he's definitely put himself in a good position to, for the for the Ulster final. Ah, yeah, I'm ju- I'm just speculating on the personality thing. There might be probably probably nothing in that. But as an attacking halfback yourself, and I was an attacking halfback myself a long, long time ago. A lot of the listeners wouldn't even remember back into the nineties. You don't have to be a good man marker if you're an attacking halfback, Aaron. Right? You, we know this. If you're going forward, you end up being marked, not the other way around. Like I, this, I I remember being dropped off the leash team because I wouldn't accept this. You need to mark your man. I says, but you're taking all my powers away. Like I mean, I, I I'm not that good to mark him I want him to mark me and then they ended up dropping me because I I, I just kept going forward I was like I, th- this is terrible but do you get my point you don't ne- I know you d- I have to accept you do leave a gap behind you yeah you do but um, I think whenever you're if that's your strength if you're if your main game is an attacking halfback which obviously I would have seen that as mine instead of being a defender I, I think the better you are, the more you do that there. What I found throughout my old career was you end up getting nearly a defender put on you. So that means yeah. that's that's only five forwards they, they then have, do you know, and, and all he wants to do is chase you, do you know. So in terms of what your defensive uh, uh, need really is, it's much more minimal because 
that fella's just there to chase you. He's not there to put you in the back foot. He's not there to take you into the full forward lane, the positions you don't want to be in. Um, so it, it is different people. Obviously, maybe the, the throne management feel that they do need to shore it up or that's why they may be going for two more out-and-out out defensive wing halfbacks or whatever. Um, but whenever you're going well and your confidence is up as a halfback, you're just you're in the zone. You can just go at the right time. You're always coming off someone's shoulder, uh, chipping over points. And I suppose if I revert back to it, I would have thought Tiernan, um, maybe just there was a number of throwing players who would have felt maybe just gone off the boil a bit. Just didn't seem to have the same zip about them. And it would be your Maddie Donnelly's, Niall Sludden, um, Tiernan, those boys that were really carrying a running game and getting on so many possessions getting scores creating overlaps they just look like they're a wee bit flat last year maybe carried that into this year um, but to be fair to him now like he couldn't do any more t- to cause hassle for his managers in the right way than what he's doing at the moment you know we all want to play we all want to start um, all he can do is turn up be positive and make an impact and to come off the bench and kick three points from play that's the best way to do your talking. Yeah, definitely. He's shown a great attitude uh, to, you know, be that positive and play that well. Um, you know, d- despite the fact he's obviously be very disappointed that he's losing. Darren McCurry, lads, we mentioned him already. We're not going to get back into it. Scored all his points on the loop instead of kick passes. Instead of kick passes in, thought he could have showed a bit more composure for the finish. You know, you see the t- you see young Matthew Costello uh, column, and he did the dummy. You see, Ar- you see uh, Jack McCarran, and he does the dummy. I would have expected a dummy bounce from McCurry there and going around him. He kind of punted it straight at him. I, I would have liked to have seen a bit more composure. Yeah, such uncharacteristic. Uh, this guy, uh, Darren McCurry, is uh, he's full of confidence at the moment. Uh, and you know, if he if he does that in, in, a, in a training pitch, he's a hundred percent throwing a dummy to the keeper and going around him and slapping it in. Like, but look, you know, I, I can always see that he wanted to. He wanted. To, you know, you don't know what's always behind you either. So he, he probably felt that he could just get the shot away. And uh, yeah, like I've had to. Unfortunately, went straight at um, straight at uh, Patton. So look, uh, yeah, he probably could have done slightly better, but look, a, a good performance from him, um, kicking not seven any day of the week. And the, as I said, you said there, like changing it up on the loop probably is, is he's very strong at, and he showed last week against Galvin or whatever that he, he was able to win the ball inside as well. So yeah, yeah. Good, good yeah. day for him. Definitely. Last one is Daniel Flynn, lads. I have to apologise to Kildare fans because they haven't got much time on the show, and I'm sure I'll be reminded about it. But we didn't see much highlights. Um, of that uh, that game on the Sunday game, um, at all he got one one. He set up the other goal. Like the, his 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 own goal, Aaron was all his own making. Am- amazingly, Cl- Cald- or Kildare hadn't won a game in Croke Park since 2016, eight games ago. So there's a little hoodoo that they have kind of you know corrected there. Jack O'Connor said, um, he said it's a very it's been a very it's been a great year for Kildare football. We're back in Division One. We're in the Leinster final. It's progress. I would argue it's not progress unless you do a Mead and put in a good performance against Dublin because you've beaten Offaly in Westmead and like Westmead are a good team but you know if you want progress for a Kildare team you know let's not rewind the clock too far back and pretend that Kildare you know have put in good performances against Dublin two or three years ago you know so like I mean I don't think it's progress until after the Leinster final would that be fair? Reality is how you fare out against Dublin that tells you how much progress you've made Yeah. Um, great to get back to Division 1 that's a box ticked but the big thing is, have we closed the gap? Are we going to be competitive? Can we stick with them for 70 minutes? Can we make life difficult? We'll know in two weeks' time. If you go back to Daniel, um, obviously to get his head up and to have the confidence to pass the ball across to Jimmy Halen Off the left. Was, was, was class for me. But what stood out the most, um, obviously he kicked a great point first half, was... Uh, I can remember I can't think of the year with the Leinster final with a run uh, Dublin close he went straight through on Cluxton oh, and yeah. buried the ball straight at him and I know I remember listening he was on the show after and he was really disappointed in himself his finish yesterday whenever he went through was class he was going 100 miles an hour he'd done all the work he, you know, he was out of breath coming in off the wing he took on a load of men but he steadied himself slowed, slowed himself down and rolled it into the bottom left hand corner so that was maximum composure whenever he needed most and for me that was just really impressive to see because he was heading through in a similar situation to where he just blasted it a couple of years ago so maybe we're seeing just a wee bit more maturity in his game now Yeah I think they actually have a pub in, in Johnstown Bridge and they it was on they were showing the replay of the game and he was hiding in around the back of the pub or something that he didn't want to see that miss it was it was haunting 
dancing them all together. Yeah. It's nice to see that column because he did. He opened his body maybe to go to the near post and then kind of you know whipped it back and it hit into the gra- put it into the ground. But listen, it was in the corner and uh, you know that's the main thing. He like he's a, he's a player get gets on Kerry team. He gets on the Dublin team as a number fourteen target man. He really yeah. does make the, make them uh, a different prospect. Yeah, there's no doubt. Like um, his game awareness is brilliant. Um, the boy said talked about the ball in the Highland for the, for the for the goal and um, yeah, look, a, a massive player, very very athletic, very powerful. Um, as we've seen for his own, for his own goal and like we're going to Kildare are going to be looking at him um, in, in two weeks time to to really step up. But aren't said there, you know, we'll know where they're at once uh, once they meet Dublin and see whether. You know, he can get that same penetration against the big team because that ultimately will tell you where Kildare is at. But in terms of Flynn himself, like he's uh, yeah, he's a he's a super footballer. He has serious pace and serious power. Um, and yeah, it'll just be interesting to see can he carry that on. And if he does, you know, and the, the close, you know, the run Dublin close. That, it's mad to say that we're saying can the run Dublin close, but um, you know, if they do that, you know, that that's going to be in my opinion. Like, Good sort of step step forward for Kildare this year. Yeah, no, it definitely is. So the performance of the weekend, I think we'll give it to Rian O'Neill for you know the consistent seventy minute performance. We had Jack McCarran good in the first half, Kieran McGeary good in the first half, Tier McCann, McCann good in the second half. Probably for minute one until minute seventy six, it was uh, Rian O'Neill on the scoreboard and the battling performance. So like I mean, he was everywhere, um, and he did it the hard way. So Rian O'Neill is performance of the weekend, right, lads? We've gone way over time. We're going to leave it there, and we'll be back. Next Thursday, there's two more provincial finals um, to to talk about. So we'll talk to you all then. Good luck.